the Lamborghini Super Trofeo. On IMSA Radio, part of the Radio Show Limited Network. Looking out at a very crowded infield, Sebring International Raceway. Welcome in, everyone, for IMSA's Lamborghini Super Trofeo North America Series. Race number two of the 2024 season and race number two here at Sebring. All the cars lined up and ready to go. And the field now following the Lamborghini Urus safety car onto the racetrack. Sebring International Raceway, such a storied facility since 1950 it has been a home for world-class sports car racing and it is the home for lamborghini here this weekend what a great racetrack and look at the names of some of those corners ullman straight gurney bend fangio it is history there on that racetrack map turn one a great place to get it done but high speed and very unforgiving heavy braking into turn seven and turn ten other good places to get passes done and if you don't get it done by sunset bend which is into the end of the back straightaway, you will not see the checkered flag first. Talk about the second race of the season, but before we get there, let's go back to the first race, take a look at how it unfolded. In the beginning, Andy Lee from the pole in that bright pink number 14 Lamborghini Huracan Super Trofeo Evo 2 leads the field, a Pro-Am entry leading into turn one, but it didn't take long for the action to happen. The number 10, Graham Doyle with a problem in his Wayne Taylor Racing with Andretti. Lamborghini gets spun contact with the wall at the exit of turn five. Then the number 66 of A.J. Muss tries to go down the inside of the 22. Door gets shot, and Muss goes for a ride. Not the only excitement on the racetrack. Tony Bullock gets a closer look at the tire wall than he wanted in turn 17 in his one motorsports entry. But in the end, Newcomers, Kiko Porto, Nico Jamin win for Ansem Motorsports and for Kiko Porto, his first race ever in Lamborghini. Moving back into the Pro-Am category, Nick Persing, Nate Stacy, they take the victory there. Nick Persing takes the flag. And then Ken Dobson celebrates his AM win and the 0-2 of Mark Brumman, another solo driver, starts the year off with a win in LB Cup. Cars behind the safety car right now. Welcome in, everyone. Brian Till along with Jeremy Shaw will bring you the action today. And, Jeremy, I would expect plenty of it. Four different categories of drivers. Classes, we'll call them, although they drive the exact same car in Lamborghini Super Trofeo. There's Pro, Pro-Am, Am, and LB Cup. Are you ready? Uh, I'm ready. I mean, yesterday was an exciting race. Yeah, a bit of a rocky start, but uh, a, a tremendous field of cars here. 37 cars. We've got five running in the Pro Class. We've got 10 in Pro Am, 11 in each of the Am and LB Cup categories. And, you know, they're, they're all mi mixed and mingled for the start of this race. Kiko Porter, the young Brazilian, 20 years of age, really impressive yesterday. A great run to take the lead during the pit stop and then hold off all comers to win his first race at this level. Today, uh, he qualifies on the pole position. Yesterday, there were two 15-minute qualifying sessions, one to set the grid for race one, the other to set the grid for race two. That is when Kiko uh, won his pole position. He will start at the front today, and he'll have Ryan Norman alongside him. Looking at the four different class pole setters, it's Kiko Porter that will start on the pole in pro. Back in pro-am, Jean Capestro de Betts aboard the number 46 from Precision Performance Motorsports We'll start on the pole in Pro-Am and Am. Sam Shee, Jeremy, we've talked about this newcomer, how impressive he's been. He'll start on the pole in Am, and then Ophir Levy will lead the field in LB Cup. They are all mixed together based upon their qualifying time, not by class, and 37 cars, a record field, taking the green flag here. Yeah, and Sam Shee, he was from China, uh, although based now in Toronto in Canada. Brilliant effort in qualifying yesterday. Start, we'll start 10th for today's race. And if he had a little incident during the race yesterday, it was his first ever motor race. So it was a very steep learning curve, but he did a really impressive job. We'll see what he learned yesterday that he can apply to today. A nice, uh, clean lineup here of cars getting ready for the green flag. 50 minutes of racing. Lamborghini Urus pace car into the pit lane. Front row lined up. Kiko Porter. Porto aboard the number four on the pole position, sees the green. What a jump he gets. 
big time jump over Ryan Norman on the outside aboard the number one from Wayne Taylor Racing. And look at the bright orange number 88 slide up the inside. That is Ernie Francis behind the wheel, I believe. No, John Torino starts today. And what a move by Torino at the start. That was, wasn't it? Uh, dive down the inside and Ryan Norman there kind of shuffled up back uh, a couple of positions, I think in the number one car. That's the car he will share with the two-time defending series champion, uh, Danny Formal. Uh, Jake Walker in car number 77, a good start. Pretty good start for him. He started in third. He might have lost a position also to, to Giano Torino, who was really on the charge there at the beginning of this race. 77 now moving up, and the one sliding back. Ryan Norman under attack, moving backwards. Not the direction you want to go at the start, but under heavy attack right now by the 77 just behind that beautiful silver and black Lamborghini really beginning to put the pressure on. Jake Walker trying to take the fight to the number one of Ryan Norman. Yeah, he's doing exactly that and a big long train of cars behind him. A nice clean start there, that's always good to see. Hopefully we can get around this first lap without any incidents like we had yesterday. There were two or three different incidents on the first lap. That The first four or five laps were run behind the safety car, but nice clean start there at the front, Kiko Porto yeah, he really is a gem. Uh, he's a lovely kid, and uh, he's worked so hard to make a career for himself. He won a championship in the, the USF 2000 Open Wheel Series, won a scholarship worth more than $400,000 to move on to the next level in open wheel. He ran there for a couple of years, won some races, but now he just sees his opportunities in the sports car world, and boy, is he taking advantage of the opportunity that's been given to him uh, by this Ansa Motorsports team and Alan Nadal and his other co-owners there from South Florida. Understand that Courtney Crone with some damage to the nose of the number 22, not sure how that happened. Top of the screen, you can see it all kind of crushed in like she was up underneath the back of a car in front of her. So don't know if that's a stack up effect in one of the corners or not, but significant damage and with the temperatures here this weekend, got to be careful about that radiator being closed up and watching for overheating Courtney Crone I believe will make her way to pit lane. Meanwhile, up front, Kiko Porto, a great run yesterday, continues it today, and a problem for the 48 at the exit of turn 17. Spun and almost hit the pit wall there at the beginning, but now back underway. Almost, but thankfully didn't. So he's able to yeah. continue. That's Michael Starb. His brother David also will be running this race, uh, but uh, he'll be sharing, actually, the car that leads now in the Pro-Am category. That's John Capestro Dubetz in car number 46, running in the sixth position overall. Should have been Tom Capizzi sharing that car with John Capestro Dubetz, but he had suffered an ankle injury a couple of weeks ago, so not able to take part this weekend. Here's a look at what happens to the 48. Man, that spin is late in the corner and then loops it back around to the inside. Does manage to get on the brakes pretty hard. Interesting to watch those hand-cooked tires lock. There's another look at it because a lot of times with a car equipped with an anti-lock braking system like these Lamborghinis do, a lot of times the car will roll backwards and the wheels won't lock. You want them to lock when you're sliding backwards, spinning yeah. across the racetrack. And he got it wowed down pretty quickly and back underway, but you got to wonder about flat spots now on those four hand cooked tires. Yeah, that's right, because uh, it, this track is notoriously uh, hard on rubber. Uh, it's not quite as, it, as warm as it was earlier in the day. A little bit sort of hazy sunshine now as we're getting into the evening here at Sebring International Raceway, but what an atmosphere that here there is. It's a massive crowd on hand, super excitement. We've had some great racing already today, and this is already shaping up into another good one. Kiko Porto out in front, but Gianno Torino aboard the bright orange 88 giving chase. And we've watched Torino in years past, impressive young man, winless on the season last year, spent the most of the time running with Lucas Peterson. Peterson missed the VIR round, but I'm impressed right now with the early pace of the 88. Very impressive uh, pace uh, in, in that car and he's, you know, slightly new look to that car this year from TR3 Racing and Gianna Torino, as you said, different co-driver this season, but uh, it, they had a, a really good start to, to, to the championship yesterday. Ernie Francis Jr. will be driving this car in the second stint of this race. So it's, it's a 50-minute it's a race. The pit, there's a mandatory pit stop that has to be made any time between 20 and 30 minutes into the race. There's a minimum pit stop time as well. So this is not about how fast your pit stop can be. No, it's all about safety. 
Uh, 20 of these cars, 20 of the 37 are running, uh, are running with two drivers sharing a car. The other 17 are solo, uh, but everybody has to make that pit stop. Uh, and uh, the time, the minimum time is from where you enter the pit lane to where you exit it. What you do in the middle is entirely up to you, but there's plenty of time to come in, make a safe driver change, and then for the second driver to rejoin. If you're driving solo, all you need to do is come in, have a chat with, with your team manager. You can't change the tires or anything like that, and then you rejoin the race. And there's a slight differential in the pit stop minimum time. For the single driver cars, it's three seconds longer than for the dual driver cars. Reason for that? Well, if you're driving this race solo, for the first 20 or 25 minutes in the race, you've, you have a perfect understanding of the track conditions, how the car is handling, how the tires are working, the balance of the car. But if you're taking over at the halfway point, you've got to learn all that. And it's going to take you a few corners to get, you know, to get right up to speed and be comfortable with the way the car is handling. That is why there's that slight differential. Leaders flash out of turn 17 underneath the bridge. Ansa Motorsports leads in the hands of Kiko Porto. But you look back in the fifth position, now trying to make the move to fourth, is the number 30. Loris Kabaru behind the wheel. They had a great run yesterday. And in fact, at the checkered flag, the first two cars under the flag were the team cars, the number four and the 30. But there was a penalty handed down for the start, a jump start for the number 30. Starting driver yesterday, Bryson Morris, a little excited at the start, got out of line, got handed a 10 second penalty. So even though they finished within a couple of seconds of each other on the racetrack, and it was a beautiful picture, I'm sure, for Ansa Motorsports, that 10 second post-race penalty moved the 30 to the back of the pro category. And so right now, well, Kabaru having to work his way up. Actually, didn't quite move it to the back of the pro category. What moved it to the back? It actually, learned, I think only lost a couple of positions uh, in terms of in the corrected time. But when the car was taken to post-race uh, technical inspection, it failed the minimum ride height test. These cars have to be, uh, they have a, a ride height, you know, the, 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 the gap from the ground to the, bo the bottom of the chassis has to be a certain measurement. It failed to meet that measurement. So that's what put it to the back of the class. I think he was still classified sixth or seventh overall, but it cost that cost him an extra couple of positions. Uh oh, there's Chris Tasca off the road. Problem for the 23. Tasca trying to get the engine refired. You see the fire out the back of the Lamborghini. The car is not having a problem and igniting because of some spilled fluid, what have you. There's a lot of extra fuel that gets dumped into the exhaust when the car spins and stalls. And a lot of times that fuel will ignite on the restart and you'll see that telltale flame out the exhaust. So Tasca back underway. Looks like the car is fine and in one piece, he's just lost a lot of time on the racetrack. Meanwhile, Kiko Porto, one of the things that you and I talked about yesterday, the Ansem Motorsports Lamborghini seem to have a very solid shock package underneath them very subtle over the bumps, and that's going to give you the confidence that you need to attack here at Sebring. Yeah, and Tim Neff has joined that Ansem Motorsports team as the uh, race engineer for this season. New look to the cars, new race engineer, new everything, new drivers uh, for the most part as well, and boy, it's effective. Uh, and Tim Neff, he's one of the most widely accomplished and acknowledged shock experts in the country. He's actually from, originally from Australia, but uh, he's an absolute master of these shocks and it hasn't taken him long to get to grips with these Lamborghinis at all. And they have very nice, consistent, fast cars. And that's what these drivers are taking full advantage of yesterday. Jean Capestro de Betts leads in the Pro-Am category, Sam Sheehan Am and Ophir Levy in LB Cup, the four different classes you can tell the class car that's coming at you or going away. Drivers right upper portion of the windshield, upper right corner. You'll see a little triangular tab. Orange is Pro, yellow Pro-Am, green is Am, and LB Cup is blue. You'll also see what I would call a chiclet, a little rectangular piece on the back of the car, the same color coding. That will give you an indication as to the class of the car there. As you see it on the 46, the Pro-Am entry, out of tower turn, John Capestro de Betts, JCD as we call him. And on his way to turn 16, he'll head through the right-hander that's coming up and then down the long back straightaway towards Sunset Bend. And if you wonder why they call that, 
It's because it's directly into the sun, Jeremy. This time of day, yeah. it could be a challenge to have good visibility heading down into 17. Absolutely is. I mean, sunset's not far away now, and uh, yeah, the, the sun is dropping low in the sky there. Thankfully, it's a little bit of haze in the air this evening, so it's not quite as stark as it might otherwise be, but it's still, it's pretty, you know, the visibility is not easy going into that final corner. Watching the cars through turn 17, always a great place to watch because the bumps are so significant there. And the drivers really have a, a group of varied lines that they take down there, Jeremy, more so than any other corner I see on the racetrack. Okay. Some like to run a little bit higher in the middle of the corner, some a little bit lower. But I'm really not sure you can escape the bumps wherever you put the car. No, uh, the, you know, you, there is no uh, escape from the bumps. I mean, that's the, the nature of this racetrack. It's a challenge for the teams, for the drivers. Uh, as well, and the cars to keep all, everything in one piece. But it's uh, it's that challenge that makes this place so enthralling, I think, for the drivers. And there's that uh, number 98 car of Sam Shee making his first ever start in a motor race yesterday. He's running where he qualified in the 10th position ahead of uh, Kevin Madsen in car number 24. That's the battle for the lead in the AM category. Top five car, looking to the inside is Madsen there, but Sam Shee does not look in his mirrors. He's just driving uh, the race, you know, looking ahead, driving absolutely beautifully at the moment. He's coached by Mark Miller, uh, but uh, only for the last week or so. So it's remarkable uh, how much Sam Shee has learned in the short space of time. 25 years of age originally from Shandong in China, but he was at, he was at school in Toronto when he was 15 years old and has stayed there, uh, fell in love with racing, and here he is making his second professional start and looking to make it a clean run today, and perhaps even come home with an AM victory. He was originally supposed to be driving in the LB Cup category for this weekend. Whoops, that's a big off-road uh, run there for somebody. He was uh, originally scheduled to be the LB Cup because, of course, he had zero prior race experience. But after the first couple of practice sessions, the series officials said, look, you're a bit too good for those guys. You better step up into AM. And there's a feather in his cap already. Had a really good run to have the pole position for today's race. And here he is now inside the top 10 with a lot of pressure behind him. Here's the problem there in tower turn. I can't exactly see which car it is, but great job of keeping the hand straight bringing the car back onto the racetrack gently, and then back you go, no harm, no foul. Maybe uh, took your breath away just for a moment, but then back underway again. Sam Shee, impressive run, like you said. Kevin Madsen just behind him in that beautiful red and white, almost American flag motif. Massively experienced. Remember, he and Ron Atsipatu won the first race of the 2023 season at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca. And Madsen, a very, very experienced driver, putting the pressure on Sam Shee, who had never raced until yesterday, as you said, Jeremy. And that's what's impressive to me. Driving the car fast is one thing, but racecraft is something that normally takes years to hone. And right now, Sam Shee showing that he is a very, very quick learner. Yeah, I mean, the, the temptation is to kind of defend your line, particularly when you see someone uh, like uh, Kevin Madsen ducking to the inside there of the, uh, to, to you know, think about perhaps making a move on the break for turn five, but Sam Shi is not put off by that at all, keeps, keeps his line and uh, keeps his advantage as well. That's a really impressive for somebody with so, well, with no prior racing experience whatsoever. New fastest lap race, super consistency here for Kiko Porto in the lead. Uh, two minutes, 3.39 last time around. Uh, each lap is just a few hundredths of a second quicker than the previous one as the fuel load burns off a little bit. Really impressive run up the front of the field. From AM, we'll go to the LB Cup leader. That's Naveen Rao aboard the number 32 from Wayne Taylor Racing with Andretti. Lamborghini Palm Beach on the side of that car as well. And Naveen Rao, interesting to see him in the LB Cup category. He hasn't raced in a couple of years, but when he did, he was quite accomplished, Jeremy. He was the 2020 IMSA Prototype Challenge champion. His run Ferrari Challenge in the past, Prototype Challenge. He's driven LMP2 cars, LMP3 cars, raced with SRO in their GT series in Europe. And like I said, it, it's been a couple of years since he's raced on a full-time basis. New to Lamborghini Super Trofeo, his first race yesterday. But a very accomplished driver. I think within a weekend or two, he's going to come to grips with this Lamborghini Huracan underneath him and he's going to be wicked fast 
I think he is, and uh, he's a candidate, I think, to be moved up a class because uh, we've already seen that this weekend with Sam Sheeb Sheeby moved up from LB Cup to uh, to Am, despite the fact he had no racing experience. I'm not quite sure how, how Naveen managed to talk himself into being an LB Cup driver, I must admit. <laughs> but uh, he's going to take advantage of that if he can. Yesterday, he had a strong run, but I think his pit stop was a bit short, and then he made a... I think he had a penalty of some sort as well. It's dropped him back a little bit in the order. So in terms of the championship, he's got a little bit of ground to make up. Not sure if Kevin Madsen made a mistake or not, but Glenn McGee has gotten by yeah. the 24. And you think about McGee and McIntosh, same driver pairing as last year. They won the championship. And I mean, a very, very talented group of guys. They they race together. They're also racing over in international or the Italian GT championship, I should say, and in the European Lamborghini Super Trofeo championship. But Kevin Matson going the wrong direction. I'm not sure well, if the handle isn't just quite right on his 24 or if he made a mistake. I, I think it's just that Glenn McGee is moving forward, quite honestly, because he, for some reason, he, he, I don't know what happened to him in the second qualifying period yesterday, but he only qualified in a 22nd position on the grid, but he's now up into 11th. So that means he's made up 11 places in the first seven laps of this race. So that number 69 car of Glenn McGee, the last year's AM champion, along with Anthony McIntosh, who did a magnificent job uh, again in qualifying and in the race yesterday. Uh, and, uh, you know, Glenn McGee is moving that car where he kind of thinks it should be. So McGee now giving chase to the rookie, Sam Sheed, just in front of him aboard the number 98, that dark green Lamborghini Huracan Super Trofeo Evo 2. Just a few minutes before the pit window opens, it is a 10-minute window that you've got an opportunity to come in and do your pit stop. And Jeremy, you explained it. If you are in the one-driver format, you're going to have a little bit longer mandatory stop, three seconds longer, because you've got track knowledge. You understand how the car is going to work. So you're an advantage. The officials take that away with that extended pit stop. But that window opens in just a couple of minutes. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Boy, that's the first 20 minutes of this race has gone past quickly. It's been nice and clean and green so far. That's good news. As you see, another two laps, and the, anybody will be eligible to come into the pits whenever they like. For the, in the Pro-Am cars, uh, the, the, the Am will hop out of the earliest opportunity and uh, put the Pro behind the wheel. For the Pro cars, uh, if it's uh, driving solo like Jake Walker is, he can come in whenever time he pleases. Uh, and then for the other three cars that are current, well, four cars are running ahead of him at the moment. They're all dual driver cars. And uh, yeah, they will time their pit stops to be made, hopefully when the pit, pit lane isn't too busy. Leaders working through and past the number 23 who had problems a little bit earlier on. Kiko Porto out in front, 2.2 seconds at the line the last time by over Gianno Torino. And then this battle, Ryan Norman aboard the number one trying to hold off the 30 of Cabaru. And remember, we said on the racetrack yesterday, it was the four and then the 30, the ANSA teammate cars, and Ryan Norman having to go defensive down the back straightaway in order to keep Cabaru behind him. He is. That, uh, the young Frenchman there, 19 years of age, two 19-year-olds sharing that number 30 car with uh, Bryson Morris to take over from Lois for the second half of this race. Both of them impressive yesterday. Unfortunately, they had that... Um, that uh, miscue and then the uh, problem in post-race technical inspection, but it, it only cost them a position or two. Cabaru a little bit hesitant to go around the 23, the lap car there in turn one, and the 77 with a wheel drop at the exit of one up at the top of the screen. Lucky to get away with that, but Ryan Norman doesn't really look comfortable right now in the number one, and it's interesting. We spoke of this yesterday. There were only three drivers who won races in the pro category last year. Danny Fromall and Kyle Marcelli, of course, they were teammates in the same car. And then Ryan Norman, all from Wayne Taylor Racing. And is that Norman with a problem? Yes, it is, isn't it? Norman with a problem. Ryan Norman aboard the number one. Everything gonna... looked fine coming out of turns right four rear. and five. But no, all the... The, all the tires look up, Jeremy. It's it, it's off pace, but now he looks like the acceleration is where it should be. So some type of a control yeah. alt delete, perhaps? Yeah, that was strange because he certainly carries good speed there through turn 10. 
but uh, he's lost uh, valuable ground. And uh, that's the car that comes into this season as a firm favorite for the championship. Uh, the uh, number one car last year shared by Danny Formal and Carl Marcelli. Uh, both of those two drivers, incidentally, are moving up to the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship this season. Carl Marcelli has a lot more overall racing experience in cars than uh, Danny Formal, and he's elected just to concentrate on that GTD entry for this season. Uh, Danny, however, he just wants to drive anything anywhere, anytime. Uh, and uh, so he got the opportunity to stay with this team. And, and uh, Ryan Norman, who finished uh, second runner-up in the championship last season, has joined Danny Formal for what should be a very potent championship challenge. And Danny Formal, obviously very quick in the car. He and Kyle Marcelli, back-to-back -back champions. And now Formal returns in the number one car for another season of Lamborghini Super Trofeo, but does a ton of karting. The window is open. Now the 88, who had been running up in the top three, dives to the pit lane. There'll be a driver change there, and we're starting to see the dominoes fall as to who's going to be making their stops. Yeah, that's right. And uh, that, that problem for the number one car, he's, going to, he's lost a fair bit of ground, but the, the top, uh, well, the top four cars all onto the pit lane, so that will leave Jake Walker in the lead of this race. He's a guy who's driving solo then in that 47 motorsports car number 77, uh, and he will stay out and lead this motor race. Number one is in as well. We saw Ryan Norman with his problems. That beautiful gold Lamborghini, the 21, Nico Rieger and Sheehan Chandrasoma share that car and now everything going on in pit lane getting that driver change done you don't change tires you don't fuel but you will see crew members going out lowering the tire pressures a little bit trying to get them back down into a more comfortable area and you'll also see them torque the the single lug to make sure that the wheel is on securely but no fuel no tires just driver changes if you're in the two driver format yeah and most of the uh cars are on the pit lane right now uh yet in yesterday's race it was the the pro who started in the pro am cars oh there's a mistake there for uh nick persing who won yesterday in the pro am uh, category and he slid off the road there i think it was at turn seven of the hairpin and that was down at the hairpin and it, yeah. the problem looked like it started early he had angled the car in towards the corner very early on, Jeremy, and that to me says, hey, I'm not slowing down as fast as I want to. So not sure if there was an ABS issue or some other kind of braking issue, or perhaps he just missed his braking marker. Typically, I wouldn't expect that out of Nick Persing, but perhaps, not really sure, but does a great job of keeping his hands straight, didn't spin the car, just drove it off, back onto the racetrack. You made one mistake, don't make another. There you go. Golden rule, Ooh, a bit tight on the pit lane. There are a couple of cars rejoining, but uh, number 77 car of Jake Walker does bring his car onto pit lane, so that will allow the two pro-am entries, John Capestro de Betts and Patrick Liddy, to lead this race. So the 47 car comes onto pit lane. Jake Walker, you doing a nice job in that opening stint. You talk about Jean Capestro de Betts. He was absolutely wicked fast. He's fast in anything he drives, right, Jeremy? As you look at the battle heading down to turn seven, the hairpin between the 14 and the 46 of Jean Capestro de Betts. He was wicked fast, like I said last year. In fact, they had three wins in the first four races, but he was injured in a crash at Road America and had to sit out a couple of races, and that really set their championship hunt back. He recuperated, healed, still wasn't good by the final round in Indianapolis, certainly drove in the final few races, but he said, I, I still hurt, but physical therapy, I'm working my way back to where I need to be, and I think he is back to where he needs to be. He's been fast this weekend, leads right now, overall and in class. He does indeed, and uh, uh, yes, yesterday uh, finished uh, fourth in the class, uh, started from the uh, class pole uh, this uh, this evening uh, and still leads the race there's the number 14 very distinctive car that's the car that was on overall pole position yesterday in the hands of andy lee uh, started today by slade stewart again also in the pro-am class and uh, that car has uh, made its pit stop so andy lee at the back of the wheel of that car now and trying to work his way forward that's one of the flying lizard motorsports entries representing the san francisco dealership all of the cars in this race 
are representing a, a, one of the Lamborghini dealerships from around the nation. Andy Lee, a great job to qualify the number 14 on the overall pole for race one. But I was interested to see that John Capestro de Betts did not pit that time, Jeremy, and, and he's the faster of the two, so you want to stay on the track and make time. But right now he's not making time, is he? Because he has Andy Lee's embroiled in this battle, and he's not able to really lay down those fast lap times. So you would think that perhaps he would have just gone ahead and come in and done that driver change. But in fact, he stayed out. Like I said, I believe the 14 may be holding him up just a little bit, but it looks like Andy Lee now beginning to learn the racetrack, learn the car, and get up to speed. But that first lap out, certainly JCD being held up just a little bit by the 14. It looked like it, didn't it? But Andy Lee, he was on the pole yesterday, so he, he knows he's got a fast car this weekend. And JCD knows that that car in front of him is quick as well. So yeah, there's no point in pushing the envelope too much and risking anything. But you're right, you know, when you make your pit stop in terms of the traffic, he's looking to, is he going to look to the inside here as uh, Andy Lee works his way past the slower car? Uh, and behind him, JCD, John Capestro de Betts tucked in behind him. Only a second or so behind them is Patrick Liddy in the Forte racing car number 72, also running in Pro-Am. And then the third and fourth place cars in this race are number nine car, Tyler Hoffman. He's uh, continuing to run out on the racetrack, but he's about 10 seconds behind. And then the fourth place car was Nick Persing after that uh, incident a lap or so ago. He's just made his pit stop to hand over to Nate Stacy. Oh, the 72 trying to work his way around the 23 and just about outbroke himself into turn 14. That time that was Patrick Liddy aboard that bright green and yellow number 72 and trying to work his way around, left his braking until really late, had gotten frustrated, I think, all the way back in turn 13, trying to get by. And then finally that lunge up the inside did a good job to keep it on the racetrack, but it certainly cost him some time. Did. Looking this down time, pit though, lane. Yeah, yeah, down the pit lane comes there the race is. leader. So Patrick Liddy, he's going to stay out one more lap in car number 72. But here comes John Capestro de Betts. And uh, the, the, the star brother, David, will be waiting, waiting to take over this number 46 car for the Precision Performance Motorsports team. So interesting, all of the pro class cars have pitted just a couple out of Pro-Am and LB Cup and the leader in AM has not pitted. So we're starting to cycle through. We'll get our order back and get some semblance of where we think everybody's going to end up. The 57 with a problem now. Stranded there. And that is not where you want to be. That's at the exit about two thirds of the way through turn 17. And really, it's pretty blind for the competitors on the racetrack. Oops. Now a problem for ah. the 98. Sam Shi, he just made his pit stop, just come out of the pits actually. This is his outlap. And uh, that was the that was the AM leader who's turned that car around under braking for turn 10. Just again, a little bit of inexperience there. Just tried to carry a bit too much speed on that lap out of the pits. The tires, of course, lose a fair bit of temperature during the pit stops. Does he get any help here? No. no he, I think he's the he helper. just gets in there, Jeremy. <laughs> He's the helper, isn't he? He's the helper, exactly. Gets in there and just left his braking a little bit late. You know, when there's a car in front of you, you can't use the same braking marker that you did the last time by because you've got another 18 feet in front of you that's taken up by the car in front of you. And I think we said it earlier, he's very, very fast. Racecraft driving in traffic is something that will come to him. And I think that yeah. was just a mistake of misjudging the car in front, yep. got in there a little deep, made a little bit of contact, and got himself loosened up and around he went. That's right, and the car in front of him was Anthony McIntosh, uh, who is the, the AM champion from last season. So he knows his way around here. And I think Sam just sort of kind of, yeah, it's a question of knowing who you're racing with. And you're new to the championship, he probably didn't realize perhaps who that car was in, was in front of him. Maybe he was thinking it was a slower car uh, because he also had just come out of the pit lane as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, caught him out a little bit, so that's going to cost him some time. Now that our uh, our race leader, who is number 72 car, uh, is uh, Patrick Liddy. He's onto the pit lane now. It'll Blake McDonald who will take over from uh, Patrick for the final portion of this race. And of course, for Sam Shee, he doesn't know anybody, right, yeah. Jeremy? I mean, <laughs> he's only had one race with him, so. 
Yeah, it, 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 a lot to learn there, uh, as we said, his first race ever yesterday. So learning the idea and the concept of race strategy, race management, driving the car, that's a lot being thrown at him, as you like to say, like drinking from a fire hose. So final pit stops being taken care of, and that's going to move the number four back to a very familiar place, Jeremy, and that is the number one position. Nico Jamin behind the wheel right now. Kiko Porto started us off and never put a wheel wrong, really picking up where they left off yesterday. They did. It's been another perfect performance so far by this pair. Another great pit stop. And uh, they've got a pretty handy lead in this race now over the number 88 car. It's only Francis Jr. who's at the wheel of the second place car at the moment, but he's uh, six seconds behind. Another five seconds back to Bryson Morris in third place in the, uh, the, the second of the Anson Motorsports cars. That's number 30. think about the performance of these cars that we saw yesterday and you know that the team had to have a meeting last night after the penalty got handed down for the 30 for being low on ride height and I would imagine that the conversation went something like we need to check our work and make sure it's correct and oh by the way to the drivers on the end lap Make sure you go another half mile farther than you need to, meaning drive everywhere you can to pick up every little piece of rubber that you can. Stick it to those hand-cooked tires that are on the car and see if we can't raise the ride height with a little bit of debris by the time we get to tech. Yeah, that's right. Old tricks. Well, you see that all the time. You know, at the end of races, it's a combination of both weight and ride height, is it not? Yeah. You could probably pick up easily a pound and a half, two pounds of rubber by driving offline on your hot race slicks, picking up old rubber. That's going to add weight. And, of course, the other thing, it adds to the circumference of the tire, which raises the ride height. There you go. There you not go. that it's ever been done before or that I ever did it, but I'm just saying. Yeah, look, uh, Kiko Porter's got everything under control right, right now. He's got some lap traffic in front of him. You're going, to make, you're going to make that pass pretty cleanly at the end of the Ullman straight. And just a little bit farther back down the be beginning of the straight is that number 30 car running in the uh, third position it will be when they cross the line because the uh, number 72 car has already completed 14 laps. There goes uh, Nico Jumin to complete that 15. Becomes the new race leader. And he's got, to get, as I say, a handy margin over the rest of the field. Last time around was a 2 minutes 5.0 for Nico Jamin, uh, almost identical time behind him by Ernie Francis Jr. in second position. Uh, and then the third place car of Bryson Morris, that number, thir that number 30 car, could be quicker. Two minutes, 4.2, three quarters of a second faster than Ernie Francis, but he's about four, that's the good news. The bad news is he's four and a half seconds behind him, but with 17 minutes still to go in this race, plenty of time to make up that deficit. Well, and hats off to Bryson Morris right now. Not only is he running in the final podium position, and the, again, a great job yesterday, but he's been a busy driver this weekend, driving also in the Michelin Pilot Challenge aboard a Hyundai, sharing that car with champion Taylor Hagler for Brian Herta Autosport. And you think about the differences, Jeremy. We're not talking a little bit different. We're talking massive differences between these cars and Bryson Morris just got off the racetrack in a car with front wheel drive and maybe considerably less than half of the horsepower that this Lamborghini Huracan Super Trofeo Evo 2 has. Front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, high horsepower, low horsepower, more aerodynamics, less aerodynamics. You, you can't come up with two different cars that, I mean, more different, I should say, and to do the job he's doing, it's very, very impressive for that young man. It is. Uh, just 19 years of age. I mean, he's got a lot of bit racing experience, Bryson Morris, over the last several years, both in this country and in Europe. Uh, he's uh, managed by Nick Jonsson, who's been around this sport a long, long time as well. And he's making sure that uh, Bryson Morris can drive as, as, drives as many different cars as he possibly can, just get more experience under his belt. And that'll serve him good for, for the... Uh, for the duration of his career. He's got a long career ahead of him, I am sure. But as you say, driving these two completely different cars. What happened there? Number four car suddenly slowed. What just happened off, to our leader? Suddenly slowed coming off the final corner, didn't he? Uh, but Absolutely. 
Nico Jamin out of turn 17 at speed. He had just gone past a slower car, and then all of a sudden at the exit of 17, the pace slowed dramatically, and it remained slowed as he's backing up into the grasp of Ernie Francis, yep. and now Francis by, and the four well off the pace. Yep. He must have some, maybe it's a gearbox issue or not, something, something like maybe he's not able to change gears. Uh, whatever it is, though, it looks like it's uh, not going to fix itself. He's dropping back down the order already. There goes Bryson Morris in two second position. As, uh, the next car on the racetrack is number 77. That's Jake Walker. That's not the car that's directly behind him at the moment. But Jake, Jake I think just how fast. Past. Yeah, just how fast things change here at Sebring and in the Lamborghini Super Trofeo action. The leader with a problem dropping back, Ernie Francis goes to the lead. And if you think you recognize the name Ernie, Ernie Francis, you certainly do. Multi-time Trans Am 2 champion. Spent the last several seasons in Indy NXT, Indy Next, getting some open wheel experience. Now trying his hand at Lamborghini Super Trofeo and having a good run here out in the lead, but a problem now for the number eight, Nate Stacy behind the wheel. Yeah. He's and off down at the hairpin. And that is the car that won yesterday in Pro-Am. Yes. So they come into this race with the championship lead. That's a disaster for them. So two, uh, well, potential class leaders hitting problems on the same lap. Whoops. Straight off. Okay. Well, that was so inflicted, but perhaps. Yeah, no, but he's just not I mean, to straight see. off, but there's yeah. a problem. He yeah. drove it straight off because there's a Indeed. problem, Jeremy. Indeed. Interesting. Wow. He had a problem earlier in turn seven. Yeah, true. If you'll remember. So, not sure what's going on right now with the number eight. I'll tell you what, number four Nate car Stacey just came behind past the, 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 the pits here. And he, he seems to be at speed this time around. The, the so some type lead, of Nico electrical, Jimmy. yeah, some type of electrical gremlin, or like you said, perhaps the gearbox. But for Nate Stacy, he and Nick Persing won the race yesterday, as we pointed out. But they're Wayne Taylor racing with Andretti Lamborghini, with Lamborghini Palm Beach down the side, stricken at turn seven with 12 and a half minutes to go. Yeah, is that going to bring out the full course caution? Is he far enough uh, off the racing line? to be uh, able to continue. That's a challenge for the race directors to decide, is he safe relatively? But if someone had a problem, a high-speed problem at the hairpin, conceivably, you could get to that car that's stranded there on the outside, but he's well off in the runoff, so they'll have to make that decision as to whether they want to stop and go get him. If they do want to go get him, they could pull him straight backwards behind a tire wall to the gate there of the seven hotel, which sits there on the corner of yeah. the hairpin. Adjourn to the bar. And get him out suggest. of harm's way. But yeah, I mean, look, he's well off the racing line there. Uh, you know, he, he's, he's pulled off onto the old racetrack, which is now bypassed Correct. by the chicane that comes off the hairpin that's kind of shortened from where it used to be back in the old days. So it, it kind of looks worse from that camera angle than, 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 uh, than it really is. Uh, and that safety safety truck is going to come out there and make sure the driver is okay, and they'll, they'll try and pull that car back. But it's it's a good 75 yards or so from the racetrack, yep. and are not really in any danger. Yeah. So they'll do their job and see if they can get him out of the way. Meanwhile, we keep racing. And meanwhile, speaking of racing, Bryson Morris hammer down. Yeah. He was 1.1 seconds faster the last time across the line than leader Ernie Francis. We'll have to wait and see what happens this time by, but there is Bryson Morris in that beautiful black and orange number 30 charging, and the four now, Nico Jamin seems to be back up to speed. Yeah. And I wonder if they're going to say, look, bring it home. Don't get in a battle with your teammate right now. We think Bryson can chase down Ernie Whoa. Francis. So, Oh, big slide there. <laughs> big slide in turn four for Bryson Morris. And now he's lost pace because of the slide, but it also looked like he backed up a little bit because he didn't have the drive off the corner. Now, obviously, he lost pace because of the slide. The yellow flag's waving in the hairpin because of the number eight off to the side. And once they move that car, they'll move the yellow flags. But everything seems fine now. 
for both the 30 and the 4. It does. Uh, it's clearly your last time around for Nico Jumin was a 204.6. That's as quick as the race leader. Uh, and a little bit quicker than Bryson Morris, and that car is certainly sliding around. And I wonder whether there's going to be any team orders here at Ansa Motorsports, because so far as the championship is concerned, uh, 12 races during this season. These are the, this is the second of uh, two, the first of uh, six race weekends, each of which will be two races during this 2024 season. And with maximum points from the first race yesterday, the number four car is, is looking good here. So. Uh, with that problem for the number 30 yesterday, fell back to fifth position in the class, which is only five uh, pro-class cars. And by the way, there, aren't, there isn't an overall championship, there's just class championships. So the pros have their own championship, the pro-ams, uh, the ams and the LB Cup drivers have their own specific championship. So it would behoove perhaps the Anson Motorsports team to allow the number four car, Nico Jumin, to get past Bryson Morris and score second place points rather than third. I'm sorry, what did you say? My radio's not working. Yes, that's exactly what the message yeah, from exactly Bryson right. Morris is going to be. So I'm sorry, what did you say? My, <laughs> my radio's not working. Pardon? And now huh? Ernie what? Francis, yes, exactly. Ernie Francis caught up in some traffic across the line the last time by. Really, Ernie Francis was a, just three tenths of a second faster than Bryson Morris. He must have gotten the message. Yeah. Hey, buddy, you got to put the hammer down because they're coming. Yeah, that's right. And uh, last uh, couple of laps, it was, he was a half a second slower on that last lap, uh, only Francis Jr. than he was the previous uh, lap around. And there's a change for the lead, by the way, in the uh, Pro-Am class. Jerome Blekamolen in car number 54 has just snuck, oops, there's a spin there for, for uh, the, uh, the Mexican TR3 and entry search. Rodrigo Valles at the wheel of that car right now. It's his uh, good buddy, Rogelio who drove in the first part of this race. And now Rodrigo had a great run yesterday. They finished on the podium. I saw him this morning. He was super pumped up about that. And uh, can you go one position better? He, he hoped so, but I don't think so no. with that spin. No, it just loses a little bit past the turn. And we talk about the braking system being anti-lock. And we talk about traction control on the Lamborghini Huracan. But it's not stability control. Once he turns in, gets off the brake, if he stays off the throttle, there is no stability control that works on the Lamborghini. It is purely traction control, meaning controls the, the spin of the rear tires only. It doesn't add diagonal braking or anything like that to help settle the car down. And so it looks like he got in there, got off the brakes, and when the car began to rotate a little bit, just couldn't get it under control, couldn't catch it, and around it goes. This is a battle now for third position in AM, the number 69 car. That is Anthony McIntosh. He's just got past Sam Shee in the number 98 car. So that is for the third position in the class. Farther down the road is Ken Dobson, who's leading in car number 27. Then Rob Walker, another good run for him in second. And those two outbreak themselves at turn 10. And uh, <laughs> I think it was I think there was McIntosh. a little. I, I think there was a little touch there by Sam Shee. McIntosh was trying to close the door a little bit, but I think there was a little touch left front to right rear there in turn 10. Let's take a look. This is a little bit earlier. Sam Shee gets a little wide. McIntosh slides underneath. That's in turn three. They almost touch there, and Shee with a big slide. Wow. Great car control, and this was just now in turn 10, Jeremy. Yeah, and uh, is there contact between the two? Yes, there is. And um, yeah, it was number 98 who was the aggressor there. And um, I don't think Anthony McIntosh will be uh, too pleased with that, to be, to be perfectly honest. The AM champion from last season. And uh, it's going to cost him a little bit of ground because uh, the number 69 car of McIntosh, he just made that pass. I mean, caught and passed the number 98. And he wouldn't be expecting a, a kind of a lunge down the inside. Nico Rieger above the number, uh, around the number 21, that beautiful gold entry, surrounded by Lamborghinis as he's trying to work his way forward and a problem for the 48 and a big problem for the 57. That's big damage to the back of that car. He's had help with that. And there is the other protagonist. In fact, two other cars off there. That was that group of cars, I believe, that was around the number 21 of Nico Rieger, the seven involved. Yeah. Don't see a lot of damage there. They get turned around. 
Let's take a look. Comes into your shot from the right side of the screen. That's the 48 going around on his own, so no big issue there. But here's what happens up here. I think that's a spin on your own. There's the 21. It's Nico Rieger, I think, that doesn't spin the 57, but gets that right rear as he tries to sneak by to the inside. So we'll have to try to take yeah. a look at the right yeah. front and the of that beautiful goal 21. Yeah, the 57 was a lap down to the 21 car, and I don't think there didn't seem to be any contact between the two there. Just a spin no. for number 57, and I think number 21 of Nico Rieger did a really good job uh, to uh, avoid him, and he's. Uh, battling with David Starbin at number 46 car. That's the battle for third position in Pro-Am. Meanwhile, out, out dodged. in front, Ernie Francis, whoops, that's a big slide there out of turn five. That gap is, actually, it grew a little bit on the last time around by about four tenths of a second between uh, first and second. And the gap between second and third has grown out as well. Maybe another we dodged a full Jimmy. course caution. We dodged a full course caution there, Jeremy. I was afraid that car was going to be stalled and we were going to have to go full course with just about four and a half minutes to go. That did not happen for Ernie Francis. He may have wished it it would have happened because it would have calmed down the battle up front. Bryson Morris just two and a half seconds behind. Jeremy, can he catch him? Yeah, well, that's the question. I mean, he, he, he was catching him, but then he wasn't. Uh, so we'll see. It's going to be a fascinating final three and a half minutes. I think just in two laps, I don't think he's going to get close enough unless there's any sort of a problem for Ernie Francis. But we saw within the last couple of laps that Ernie's right on the limit with that car. The car's sliding around when we were late in the race. It's late in the evening. Uh, and the car is definitely sliding more than it was earlier on. So it's a handful out there. But Ernie Francis, oh. he's used to driving high horsepower cars. Oh, it's synchronized spinning. Okay. I like it. Yeah, the 98 goes around, the 57 again. And this is, these are the problems for Ernie Francis, right, Jeremy? Yeah. It's the fact that it is late. The racetrack is dirty. Drivers are getting tired. And if he has to come up to some of this lap traffic, that could slow him down enough to allow Bryson Morris to get there. Catching him is one thing, though. Getting past him is something altogether different. This is what's going on late in the going. Three wide through turn one. It's wild. Absolutely wild. Was it no white flag this time around? No, we've still got two and a half minutes remaining, so it'll be white flag next time. That's a big slide. And there's for the, the problem uh, for she. Car. Yeah. <laughs> the problem for she there. He spins and goes around. Grote in the 57. Kind of synchronized spinning, as you said. And well, she didn't go around. He just got big time loose, and I think that's what checked yeah. up the 57. Yeah. But he did go everything back, except go back it, to, didn't he? Yeah. Go back to the fact that this is the minefield that Ernie Francis has to go through for the next two minutes. Yep. Yep. Two more laps. Well, lap and a half now for Ernie Francis. The gap to second position, 2.3 seconds. So Bryson Morris was uh, just a couple of tenths of a second only faster than him last time around. That's really not enough. It is not enough. And... Bryson Morris aboard the 30 now has lap traffic that is going to kind of stall his charge up to the front. He's got to hope that Ernie Francis runs into the same predicament, but I don't see a lot of cars in front of Francis right now. And the 30 is passed and the 40 there as well. It's so interesting, Jeremy, for Nico Jamin. The four car seems to be back at speed. It has not had a hiccup since we saw that problem drop him out of the lead. And I don't know if... I mean, we've seen this before in other series. I have no idea where the kill switch is yeah. in a Lamborghini Super Trofeo Huracan, but it could be simple as that because the engine got refired, the car got back up to speed, and now he is back on it, yeah. but he has gone from first to third, and Ernie Francis trying to take advantage. Yeah, indeed so. And a couple of laps ago, clearly, I think there was another glitch on that number four car, but uh, Nico been up to speed now. He's closing down again to Bryson Morris. He's had the fastest car of the race. It looks like he's going to come away with a third place finish, but hey, look, who's counting any chickens before the end of this race? A white flag flies, so one lap to go for Ernie Francis Jr. The leader in the bright orange, number 88, through the apex of turn one, out to the exits, over the bumps. He's cleared that, one of the more treacherous areas of the racetrack. But Bryson Morris, Nico Jamin, clear it as well. But three and a half seconds back, 
at the start finish line last time through for Bryson Morris. Ernie Francis knows not only, Jeremy, how to win races, he knows how to win championships. He does. He's done it a lot, hasn't he, over his uh, career? I mean, it's amazing to think he's still only 26 years of age because it seems like he's been around forever. Uh, and he's been uh, he's been a winner in, in just about everything he's done. He didn't win an Indy Lights race in the last couple of years, but I tell you what, that was a, a steep learning curve for him. He'd had only one season of open wheel racing before that in the Formula Regional Series, uh, and he had a podium in Indy Lights, which is no mean feat. Very, very talented Battle driver. going on here for third There's position in uh, in the Pro Am class as well. Andy Lee in car number 14. That. Uh, the Sparkle Farts, number 14, the the, the, the uh, pink car, pink unicorn car is caught right up with Nico Riga. That's going to be a heck of a battle in the final uh, three and a half miles. Four different classes. There will be four different race winners. And Jeremy, as you alluded to, the championships handed out based upon class, not an overall champion. And Ernie Francis certainly not taking it easy as I watched that car slide through 15 and 16 onto the back straight away one final time. Yeah, it's been a tremendous uh, performance. John Atruno made a great start and uh, handed over the car to Ernie Francis in good shape, and uh, he took advantage of that, that gremlin of some sort for number four and uh, just uh, the final corner here for Ernie Francis Jr. There has been an explosion of youth in Lamborghini Super Trofeo. They've discovered the magic of this class. And for Ernie Francis, Gianno Torino, they have discovered how to win. They'll take the victory here at Sebring in the pro category of Lamborghini Super Trofeo North America. Checkered flag is out. Now waiting for the other class leaders to come through. It's Jerome Bleekemolen leading in Pro-Am right now with a sizable lead over McDonald in the 72, then Nico Rieger aboard the 21. And for Tim Pappas, Jerome Bleekemolen, they've won races around the world. Now they will win in Lamborghini Super Trofeo, and they do it at Sebring. Yeah, well, no, nothing better than that. I mean, such a historic racetrack here, tremendous performance uh, by Jerome Bleekemolen and Tim Pappas. I mean, Tim drove a brilliant race yesterday. That's uh, uh, two... two uh, uh, podium finishes for them to start off uh, the season. They finished third yesterday uh, and come away with the win today. Ken Dobson will cross the line, take the win in the AM category, and will wait for Naveen Rao, who leads in LB Cup right now, and that would be a triumphant return to racing. We talked about Rao not running for a while, but has a championship under his belt in the IMSA categories. This would add another race win. It will happen in a car that he has not driven until this weekend, or not raced until this weekend, I should say. One last time through turn 17. And for Naveen Rao, he sees the checkered flag at this point in time. He knows that victory is his across the line. Rao celebrates winning LB Cup at Sebring. Great yeah. job. Yeah, tremendous job uh, today. No no mistakes. Uh, and he comes away with that uh, with that victory. He finished uh, yesterday only fifth in the class. And just looking uh, unofficially at the points in the pro category, uh, Ernie Francis Jr. and Gianno Torino with the, the win today and the second place finish yesterday will have 27 points uh, to the 26 of yesterday's winner and pole sitter, uh, Kiko Porto. They finished third today. They'll have 26 points. So one point differential then in favor of today's winner, Ernie Francis Jr. and Tiano Torino for TR3 Racing. I mean, that team has to be excited by what they have seen this week in the performance of their drivers as Ernie Francis heads to victory lane. And, and, and I think victory here does a couple of things. Obviously, it adds confidence for the drivers, but it adds confidence for the team as well. Talk about TR3, Francis Torino taking the victory there. Great run by Bryson Morris. I'm interested to know what happened to the four, though, Jeremy. That'll be interesting yeah. to find that out. And one more time, I think the number one from Wayne Taylor Racing with Andretti, Danny Formal, Ryan Norman, I just don't think they had the car they wanted this weekend. No, they didn't for some reason, and uh, that's really unusual because uh, Wayne Taylor racing with Andretti. I mean, that's been the, the powerhouse team now for 
for the last, well, pretty much since this championship started, the last several years, certainly, they won the Danny Formal, uh, along with Carl Mosley, they won this championship uh, two years in a row, and they're both super fast drivers. Uh, but uh, TR3 uh, and uh, Ansa Motorsports have come out fighting this year. Just looking at some of the points in the other Ken classes. In, in Pro-Am, with the win today, unofficially, Jerome Blake Mullen and Tim Pappas will have 25 points to the 24 of Blake McDonald and Patrick Liddy, who finished second uh, two days in a row. Uh, in Am, Ken Dobson, a clean sweep, so 30 points for him. Uh, for Forte Racing, and in LB Cup, unofficially, uh, with a second position today to add to his win yesterday, uh, third place finish today to add to his w win yesterday, Mark Brummond should have the points lead. Lamborghini Super Trofeo, all the cars headed back to pit lane now. It's a great weekend here at Sebring. And I know for these drivers, they had to wait a long time to get the 2024 season going. It probably seemed like a very long winter. Some of them got to test. Others, well, maybe they should have had an opportunity to go a little bit more. Sebring, it is the party place. It is spring break. Sand on the beach. We've got it on the racetrack. And we had some absolutely fantastic racing going on. The kids loved it. The families loved it. The fans loved it. So did the drivers. We'll see you next time for more Lamborghini Super Trofeo.